tonight we're going to be continuing on our series that we've been on for a while. And the question is, is why am I not something else? I'm, I'm a member of a Baptist church. I pastor a Baptist church. Why would I not attend a different kind of church? Is it just because it's my flavor that I'm used to? Is it just because uh, it's how my parents raised me to be and they said, you're a Baptist because you were born a Baptist? Is that why? Is it a matter of, um, I just, I looked at them all and said, you know, they're all good. Mine's pretty good, better than most. I'll pick that one. Is that what it is? So tonight we're going to be looking at another group of people. Last time we looked at the Seventh-day Adventist and why I am personally not a Seventh-day Adventist. Tonight we're going to move on to another group that came out of that Adventist movement of the mid-1800s and has now become it's an entity totally unto itself and one that is, is rather unique in, in, um, in, in the different branches, you might say, of those who consider themselves to be in some sense Christian. And so tonight we're going to be looking at this question, why am I not Jehovah's Witness? Now, let me hasten to say that I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I am. Okay? But I do not belong to the organization that has billed itself for now several decades as the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they have now claimed that title. They have stolen it in the same way that many of our words have been taken and tainted and to the point at which today, if you say I'm a Jehovah's Witness, it, it puts you instantly in a, in a part of an organization that I do not want any part of. And tonight we're going to find out why. Now, for, for uh, the sake of brevity, we're going to watch, uh, a, it's a, just a very short little video that we've seen several of. And I, I like the way this gentleman does his videos because um, I'll, I'll be honest that in the comment section on YouTube of this very video, the very first comment was somebody saying, um, I grew up Jehovah's Witness, and this video is 100% accurate and totally unbiased. Thank you. And so, uh, now, I'll be honest, when I begin speaking after the video, I will not be unbiased. I believe they're wrong. But I want you to see just a plain vanilla what they would say they believe. If you are familiar with your doctrine, you will not take any more than this one video to say, I'm not that. So the, the, my point is not because I think that we have people in here who are on the verge of joining the Jehovah's Witnesses, but here's what I do believe. I do believe that something inside of some of us is afraid to talk to them because they might prove us wrong. They might know our Bible better than we do. Let me just hasten to tell you it's not the case. Now, I'm not saying that there's none of them that know, don't know some verses and they'll take you to a verse you maybe can't answer. But I'll just tell you right now, if you have any desire to know truth and know what you believe, and if you've gone through your Bible at all, you say, well, why do we believe that one? If you've done that surface level, you'll have no problem ever in understanding why you're wrong. It would help you, though, to have some verses maybe that you could use with your Jehovah's Witness friends. Uh, but I will tell you tonight, we're not going to go into that too much. It's sick of time. It takes us too long. Um, some of the guys who've been with me out soul winning, um, I do not shy away from talking to Jehovah's Witness. Uh, I've had people very strongly suggest that I do that, not waste my time. Uh, but my own feeling is that um, if, if somebody from, were to talk to me as a young man, um, I would not change instantly. But I had some people challenge me with my beliefs, and I went away very unsettled and went to God in, in deep sincerity, willing at one moment to I, I actually contemplate, I realized I would, I would be uh, abandoning my, the, the, the faith of my mom and dad. I would be abandoning what my, my, all of my youth group and my, the people at my school. I went to a church school. Everything, all these, I would, I would be telling them, you're all wrong, and they would look at me as apostate. But I made a commitment to God. I will do that if I believe that your word is teaching me something other than what I've been taught already. That decision took place because I had a conversation with someone from another religion that he brought some verses to me that forced me to go back and think and pray. And so when I'm talking to someone from another group, it's even doesn't matter how strong they are, including Jehovah's Witnesses, I want them to walk away and know this. I am either not going to do this as strongly to get answers, or I am not being honest with myself. And I want them to know from that moment on that I am doing this just to satisfy the group I'm in, not because it's true. So that's why I talk to them. And uh, hoping that what will happen is they'll walk away very unsettled and saying, okay, I want to find the truth. And if they don't, at least their conscience will be pricked knowing that they are spreading heresy. But tonight we're going to watch this video and then we're going to go into a different angle. I want you to understand them from a new perspective. I'm not claiming to be unbiased. I'm claiming to be honest, though. And I believe that my perspective is correct. But we're going to watch this for a moment and then we will move on. 
teachings of Charles Taze Russell, who started a Bible study group that was heavily influenced by Adventist teaching. From this came the Bible Students Movement, and Russell started a publishing company. The movement would splinter, and one part of it under President Joseph Rutherford took the name of Jehovah's Witnesses. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society set the doctrine of the group, especially through Watchtower Magazine. Still today, doctrines are established by its governing body. These doctrines include rejection of the Trinity. Jesus is not God, and the Holy Spirit is just God's active force and not a person. They teach that Christ invisibly returned in 1914 and established his kingdom in heaven. Jesus died on a torture stake and not a cross. God the Father has a spirit body and is not present everywhere, but only in one place at a time. In eternity, a special group of 144,000 people will go to heaven, while most of the saved will live on a paradise earth for eternity. The unsaved will be completely annihilated. There's no eternal hell. Every Christian organization and denomination is viewed as apostate. For salvation, works are necessary and a person can lose salvation. Baptism is for adults, but there is no formula used. They do practice the Lord's Supper, but only the 144,000 can partake. Since most don't believe themselves to be in that group, they don't take the elements. There is a future millennium or 1,000 year reign of Christ, and those who die in spiritual ignorance will get a second chance at that time to hear the gospel and be saved. Witnesses don't accept blood transfusions, don't go to war, don't vote don't celebrate Christmas, Easter, or birthdays. They shun people who leave and are forbidden to read anti-Watchtower literature. Good, we'll stop right there. If you went there, if you just watched that very fast, they do not believe in a literal hell. They believe that Jesus was just terrorizing people for the fun of it. Jesus spoke so much about hell. He said, it'd be better for you to pluck out your right eye than to have your right eye send you to hell. He said that. I think there's a hell. He described people in hell. Like what's going on there right now. Um, this is a group of people that have, on so many different levels, they have rejected the word of God. They do not believe that Jesus is God. They, they believe strange things about the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't matter what you show them. It's just a constant battle, but it's still good to show it to them. So I want to just talk to you for a few minutes, though, and, and kind of uh, just, just, just focus in on me for a moment and understand. I want you to understand them from this perspective. If you look around uh, and find uh, their meeting houses, their meeting houses are not called churches. They are called kingdom halls. They have, in their history, not attempted to consider themselves to be a church, per se. This is what they are. This is how they started to be. There was a man, as you saw, named Russell. J.T. Russell started an organization printing Bibles and tracts. It's called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. It was started in 1881. He had come out of the Adventist movement, and the Adventist movement was a movement that believed that, that uh, Jesus' second advent was happening almost instantly. And we've talked about that in recent weeks, about the fact that the, the, the uh, movement of God in America made it seem pretty obvious that, that maybe we were coming into a brilliant age of the kingdom when, everything, when Jesus would come back and be king as everybody would become a Christian. It kind of looked like that for a little while. And so certain uh, uh, Bible teachers wanted to, to gain a following by making certain predictions and, uh, and, and getting people on board. And so this man began to write a, 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 a magazine. And so this, this magazine... Um, he, he did not do it as a service as in the sense that he just printed out 10,000 and hand them out. No, 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 no. These were, uh, these, this was an organization that needed to make uh, money. And so it was simply a, a, a organization where they were selling these things. Now we sell, would sell them online. Now we would go on amazon.com. We would do that kind of thing. But for the, for this organization, which was not known as anything about Jehovah or witnesses at the time. It was known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. He began to teach some things that were different from everyone else. And let me say that this is a big danger of Bible teachers. Every Bible teacher, including yours truly, loves it when I present a truth to someone and see the light bulb go off and have them look at me like, wow, I had no idea that was there. Here's the problem, though. It's not like there's that many that no one else has discovered except William Miracle. There's a point at which I have no longer any really incredible nuggets that you've never seen before, unless I manufacture them. And it's possible to do. 
And there are good preachers who turn bad because they've had, they're brilliant and God has used them, but they're, they've loved the feeling of showing the word of God in a new light. And so they, as they go through their ministry, they, they, they begin to have to find somehow, I'm looking for this new light and they don't have it. And they want to have that, 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 that thrill again of, of exposing this brand new thing. I remember hearing a great preacher at a youth conference that I attended who found the next, I mean, he'd done this many times, but this time he found America in the book of Revelation. You know these, these big grasshoppers or lo lo locust things? Those were helicopters, attack helicopters. That was pretty amazing. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> Maybe he's right, you know. Okay, wait, okay, what's up? Yeah. We're going to find this. So this man, Mr. Russell, had that exact same thing. He was having this magazine where he was, he was giving, he was finding things in his research that nobody else had ever found. Now, there was a story that uh, I did not tell for many years because I wasn't sure if it was not, whether or not it was apoc apoc apocryphal, which means just, it was, it was, I wasn't sure if it was a legend or not. I've since found out that it's actually true. And so this actually did happen where during his lifetime, as he was finding all these different neat things about scripture and the Hebrew and the Greek, and, and uh, there was a, a preacher who stood up against him and, and publicly pronounced that he was, uh, he was a charlatan. He was a fake, a fraud. And so Mr. Russell sued him. So uh, while at court, when Mr. Russell was on the stand, he was cross-examined by the defense for the man he had accused uh, of, of uh, slander. And, uh, and so that, that lawyer simply got up and asked him one question. Mr. Russell, would you please quote for us the Greek alphabet? Now, if you know Greek, it probably starts with that, right? What's the first letter? Second letter? Oh. What's the last letter? Oh, okay. At least I three down. Right? You could not do it. Case dismissed. Plus, you know. I don't know how that lawyer did it. Brilliant move. But this man, he wrote things in a magazine because they had to be things sensational enough that people would buy his magazine. And so he began to write things, especially about the end times. And so he began to, to make prophecies about the end times. And so now here's the thing. You've got to sell these things. And so he came up with some very strange doctrines that no one else had ever seen before or, or that were very obscure. One of those was this idea. Now, I want to just show you how brilliant this is. Now, I want to just propose this to any young man who doesn't love God but wants to become very powerful and not have to do too much work to get there. Girls, it also would work for a young lady, too, if you ever want to try this. Here's what you do. Start a good magazine. I guess in our case, a, a, a subscription-based website. And make prophecies that you can get people to believe in. And here's the thing, though. Instead of paying them, teach them that their eternal life is based upon how well they sell your magazine. This is, this is how you get paid. So now you say, Pastor, no one's ever asked me to pay money for, the, for a Watchtower magazine. You can just pick them up. They're free. That's right. Now that's the case. That's, that's a brilliant move later on. But at the beginning, the way that, that Mr. Russell made a living was by selling his magazine. He had to have salesmen to do it, and so he enlisted people with this idea. Here's the idea that every church that's out there has apostatized. But God has chosen our magazine, our organization, our society, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, to uphold truth into the end times. He then discovered, after making several wrong predictions, that Jesus was going to come back, the end of the world was going to happen, in the year 1914. And so he, uh, he began to sell these magazines in droves. If you can imagine, if you believed that, and if you believe that your, uh, your, your family members had to become believers in this doctrine in order to have hope of a good eternity, and there's one more great move about this too. He discovered that there was only going to be 144,000 people in heaven. And these people would, would rule as kings and priests for everyone else. And so the, uh, those who didn't quite make it but were, were doing pretty good, they could rule and reign on the earth, and, uh, and, and, but, but they would, they would every, the only 104,000 go to heaven. 
Those slots were still available. Many of them were still available. In the first 2,000 years, not too many have been filled. And so now it became this. You have a chance, if you are a good enough salesperson, not just to gain eternal life on earth, but you could actually go to heaven. And so you get to be part of the class of people, the Jehu class who get to experience uh, heaven there. And so uh, everybody else who doesn't quite make it, they're part of the Jonadab class. They're going to stay on the earth and they get to have a good time running around a new earth that has been revamped and, and, and it's is going good. So imagine this then happening where you have this prediction. The reason for the prediction is because you're going to have really good sales if somebody says, I've got proof right now that the end of the world is coming in exactly four years, three years, two years. Now, as you get closer, he in, in, 20, in 1912, he gave himself an out. It could be 1915, just to be honest. 1914, 1915, but it's going to be there. So as this organization continued on, um, 1914, he decided it was going to be October of that year. And some, I mean, he had the best luck <laughs> because something happened in 1914. It was not the end of the world. But it looked like it. And it started in October of 1914. It was called later on the Great War. We now call it World War I. But it was called the Great War. And he, of course, said, there it is. This is the tribulation happening. We're in the end. This is it. And I don't know how this works, but somehow sales really did well. And uh, so he ended up, uh, 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 just to tell you something, he had to revamp his date because if you know, Jesus did not come back in 1914 or 1915 or 1916 as he continued to, 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 uh, to uh, revamp. But he finally explained that what actually happened, oh, I got it wrong. What actually happened was that I'm three years off. The reason is, is because the temple was not destroyed in 70 AD as I I first messed up my calculation. It actually was destroyed in 73 AD, so we got three more years of this. It didn't happen, though, folks. So now what do we do? The, the, the cash cow is going to dry up if we keep, if we keep along again, right? So, ah, you know what it is? Jesus did come back spiritually, not bodily. He's coming back bodily, though. Keep selling magazines. And then Mr. Russell uh, went into eternity himself um, in, in, 18, in 1916, and in 1918, it still did not happen. They had a new uh, 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 leader that came in, a lot of controversy there, but the main leader became a guy named Judge Rutherford. Judge Rutherford is the one that really turned the Jehovah's Witnesses more to what they are today than they were at that time. Judge Rutherford, though, had a problem. Judge Mr. Rutherford, he had a big problem. As this movement expanded and as more salespeople got involved, because they're all trying to get the ticket into heaven, eventually the tickets into heaven dried up. There were no longer any around to get. So the Jehovah's Witnesses changed their sales tactics in this way. If you ever talk to Jehovah's Witness and say, you don't want to go to heaven? He will tell you this. Who would want to go to heaven? He's been taught that way. Heaven's like boring. I want to stay on a beautiful earth. So they began to market the fact that, well, there's no more slots in heaven, but you can still rule and reign on this earth if you're part of our organization. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because now you have this idea where if I go out and I sell enough magazines, then I can do it. I can make it. And uh, so they, they were making lots of money, lots of money, lots of money. Uh, Mr. Rutherford had his own bout with, uh, uh, with predictions. He, he decided that uh, some of the patriarchs were coming back. And uh, so you can now today, to this day, you can go and see that the, uh, the house that, that uh, the, the, the society purchased, a huge mansion that uh, in 1920, let me get the date here, I believe it was 1925, that, uh, that they built, uh, they bought a beautiful house, you can still see it today, in San Diego, California, so they can, they can welcome in uh, different patriarchs, Abraham and so forth, when, when, they, when they came back and, uh, in, 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 at, at the prediction, which would be uh, 1925. And uh, then, so, I, I, I got to tell you the truth, it didn't happen, but Mr. Rutherford benefited the fact that he personally lived in that mansion the whole time. So, but, but the, the, they never came back. 
they, he learned his lesson, though, and they, they did not predict anything again until 1975. And when they predict, they're very good about predicting to the point at which their people believe it, but they have culpable deniability. They can go back and say, well, we never really said it. Show me where I really said it. And all the people that are like, we gave our lives to this because you said it, but we didn't really say it. But they, they, it's, it's, here's what it's all about. We use these tactics to generate a certain buzz that will get people selling our magazines. But folks, what every website out there has figured out is that you do a whole lot better with a subscription-based model. So here's how that would work then. Instead of selling you our magazines, we're going to use our magazines to teach you that we are the only organization that's of God. And that if you're going to be right with God, you're going to give us your tithes. Because I'll tell you the truth, I would do way better to get you to give me 10% of your money for the rest of your life than to just get you to buy a book every once in a while, right? So that's when they switched over to, uh, to, to, to not selling it, but to giving it out because each member they can recruit in becomes now a, a, a lifelong subscriber and they give giving them 10% of everything they make, and so it works out really well. And if you say, well, Pastor, wh why would they call the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because it was a good marketing ploy that started in 1930. If you were to be in 1929, wouldn't call it that. 1927, wouldn't call it that. 19 now, now, to this day, that is still what they call their outreach people. People that come to your door are called publishers. Publisher, that's their title. They are publishers. And their group to this day is incorporated in New York State for the whole world. It's incorporated in New York State as a corporation known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, folks, you say, Pastor, who would ever get involved in this then? Because what I just gave you was the non-fluff version. You understand that? I told you exactly how it is. And it's all made for one thing, to funnel everyone in by, by fear that they're going to miss out on eternal life and that they have to be part of the organization. And, if you, and I won't go deep into it tonight. I, it would, it would, it's actually scary to see how much control they have over their membership. I mean, if, if New Hope Baptist Church had that kind of control, we would have bigger offerings probably. But uh, it's, uh, they, they, they just, just uh, seven months ago, they stopped something they've been doing for the last hundred and something years. And that is every single baptized member had to turn in an activity report to be in good standing so they could maybe have eternal life to the headquarters in Brooklyn. Wow, could you imagine? You have a, you have a certain minimum you have to have. Now, let me tell you what's wonderful about Jesus Christ. If you are a born-again believer, you're fine. Whether you're a good witness for Jesus Christ or not, in other words, you're going to heaven. Your eternal life is not based upon what you do. We're in uh, Revelation chapter 7. Let's look at a few things real quick. Uh, just because you say, Pastor, is it maybe true that there's only 144,000 that go to heaven? Well, let's look at it here. In verse number 1 of chapter 7, it says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea nor on any tree. And I saw another angel descending from the east of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the states of America. Do you see that right there? Okay, I'm just joking. According to the Word of God, these 140,000 are specific to one nation. What is that nation? Israel. You say, maybe it's spiritual Israel. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't just tell you what nation. It's very specific according to each tribe. Verse 5. The tribe of Judah, 12,000. Reuben, 12,000. Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtalim, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Zebulun, 12,000. Joseph, 12,000. Benjamin, 12,000. Now, that's 12 tribes, 12,000. 12 times 12 is 144,000. 144, now, you get it right there. 
Now, the reason I brought you here is because I want to show you the next verse. Verse number 9 gets me super excited because it says here, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations. That's El Salvador right there. Right? That's Peru. That's Germany. That's Zimbabwe, Canada, America, of all nations. Wow. No man could number it. And kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne. Let me ask you this. Where is God's throne? Amen. Where are these people at when they're, when they're doing whatever they're doing? Where are they at? They're in heaven. A huge multitude that no one could number before the throne. Wow. And before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Aye. And, they, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Let me just tell you, if anybody ever says there are only 144,000 people in heaven, they're not telling the truth because we can count that high. There's a whole other group, folks, that no man can number. These are what the Bible calls the saints. Someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now tonight, let me tell you, I'm just gonna, this is for New Hope Baptist Church. Folks, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, Jesus, just before he ascended up into heaven, gave this as his last and final command. It says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's our job. A group that stands up to, to represent a magazine, a, a, a Bible and tract society, to sell the literature and eventually to say, you know what, we'll give it out as long as you become a, you know, you teach you how you need to become a subscriber. Let me just say, folks, it saddens me to see these people dress up like they're Baptists and then Baptists dress up like the world. And stand by their little sign and smile while they're out there. You know why they're doing it? Can you help me get eternal life? Can you help me, please? I need, I need some eternal life. Yeah, I'm, do, I'm doing this because I have to. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to give you eternal life by grace. Free gift. But I'm, I'm asking you, now that I've bought you with my own blood, would you consider becoming a witness for me and tell others what I did for you? And then while they're out there holding their sign, while they're out there passing out the literature, we're just at home doing our gardening, having our hobbies, our lives, and considering ourselves superior human beings. You ought to be better than them at this. Here's why. We have real hope. I was uh, in Portland, my family. We thought, hey, it's my chance. I'm going to go see the world's largest bookstore. My two older kids were in high school. They had no time for any other books. So I put them in a coffee shop of some sort across the street from the world's largest bookstore. Took my two little girls. We were going to go explore the bookstore. So I went in there, saw some books, whatever, and, and uh, my wife and they were with them, or whoever it was. And, but every once in a while, I'm like, I hope my kids are obeying. You know what I mean? So I would cross over and check on them. On the corner, though, was a couple nicely dressed people. And they had uh, a stand with some literature on it. And so something, folks, that says to me, are they going to truly deceive the multitudes, those who are hating sin, those who hate the darkness of Portland, Oregon, in its crazy moments during the pandemic, 
if they finally turn to something, are they going to turn to this organization which is going to bind them? Truly is bondage, if you know anything about it. So I, I just feel like it's my responsibility for them to at least one time face someone who's not going to let them think, I can't take you on spiritually. So I got myself ready. I got my iPad with my verse. In their New World Translation, you see, by the 1950s, they had diverted from the Bible so far, they had to publish their own. Otherwise, it was super easy just to just keep everything they were So they had their own version. I downloaded it. Now, many of the things that I want to show them, they've changed it completely. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a little g God. The Word, Jesus Christ, was a little g God in their Bible. Blasphemy. But I have my verse. This verse, the Lord had given to me a while back, and uh, I went, it was a homeless guy, and I said, hey, bud, you want, to, you want, you want them to just read a verse they won't read? I'll show them a verse. I'm, watch this. They're not going to read this. I said, would you mind reading my verse for me? And he said, sure, sure. And they got their Bible out to read it, and I said, uh, yeah, that's a, here you go. And I gave them my verse. And I said, what? They won't read this. And so they, they you know, for some reason they have to, they never just read it. They always said, let me, let me just look at it real quick. And they read it. Hand me back the iPad. I told you. So I just put it in their face. I said, you won't. That right there. And I asked them a question about the name Jehovah. They got all messed up. I went across the street, checked on my kids. While they were there, here's what happened. When I started talking to them, they instantly took on their sign, put their stuff away, and they left. I went check on my kids. Came back. They're gone. Minutes later, came back. They're back again. Thought I was gone. Except now there's four of them. So I'll take the challenge. Let's do this again. Show up my verse. Here's my verse. Let's do this again. As soon as they went up there and started talking to them, packed up everything, left. Sign comes down, literature goes in cases, all their briefcases, and they, they're gone. Check on my kids. Smack them. Get back to work. Or whatever. They know whatever it was. Come back. Now, let me say it happened one more time. And this time, they were back with six people. So I'll take it on. My homeless guy friend was still there. I said, they're back again. He's laughing. <laughs> I open it, and there was another man. Oddly enough, he's a little younger than me. Not very young, but he's younger than me. You know, he's, he's, some of these are older folks. And he came up and he said, uh, hey, let's, come, come over here. I said, no, it's okay. I'll stand right here. I want them to read my verse. He said, I'll, I'll read your verse. So we, we, we start, he actually takes me, and this is a, a, a whole city block that him and I walked around so that I wouldn't bother them. And he talked to me the entire way through, and I got to just lay into him. But halfway around, he finally said, okay, what is, let me, let me I'll, I'll look at the verse then. But he refused to see it in my iPad, even though it was a newer translation. He insisted on looking at his phone and his online Bible. So I told him the reference, he opened it up, and I peeked over. And lo and behold, it was highlighted in his phone Bible. I pour into him verbally. You already knew about this. You've known about this. And that man just wanted to get away from me, but for the rest of my walk, I just let him the same way that I would want somebody to talk to me if I were in a cult that I refused to get out of, no matter what verses you showed me. Folks, that man is probably still a witness today. I showed my same verse at Haworth Park with, my, with just by myself to a man there. Uh, there were two old men there. And then uh, the next time I was there, they were both back. And my here was my, my first name. I thought you were a man of honor. Did you figure out the verse? He said to me, oh, what was that verse again? Oh, you forgot the verse, did you? Let's go back again. This time I was with, was it Hannah or was it, who, who was I with? Were you Hannah? We went over it again. I was there recently with Brother Joseph Loda. Same men there. Same conversation. Let me just say that they do not have answers to their own version of the Bible but they don't care. They are in it hook, line, and sinker. 
Tonight, let me tell you, it's our job to do two things. Number one, to be honest with them. Number two, to be actual witnesses for Jehovah. We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's not be intimidated. We gotta, we gotta pray. Father, I pray you please help us, Lord, to be 